Vandaag bij Antwoorden met Bailey Conley. And you know, it might just be there's someone in your own life that you've sort of written off, that you think they're an enemy. It's not always so wise to do that, my friend. Because everything we think about people is not true. Welkom bij Antwoorden met Bailey Conley. Het leven kan soms een uitdaging zijn. Maar of het nu gaat om financiën, relaties, gezondheid of de vraag naar je doel in je leven. één ding is zeker. God ziet je. Hij houdt van je. En wat er ook aan de hand is, hij heeft de antwoorden op je vragen. En waarom moet je vinden 2 Samuel... 2 Samuel chapter 17, if you would. We are going to pick up a story at a very interesting point in Israel's history. David is the king of Israel at this time, and he has a son named Absalom. Absalom is handsome. He's charismatic, but he's wicked. And Absalom actually turns the hearts of the people away from David and to himself. And then Absalom basically takes over the throne. And David flees with a small band of people from Jerusalem empty-handed and broken-hearted, and some are even cursing him and throwing stones at him while he is leaving. He's been betrayed by his own son and by his most trusted counselor, a man named Ahithophel. And it looks like all is lost. What Absalom, David's son, does is he gathers all of the armed men from all over Israel And they give chase. So he's literally got this huge army behind him. He's leading the army. He's going out to find and kill his father. And we pick the story up in 2 Samuel 17 in verse 27. Now it happened when David had come to Mahaniam that Shobi, the son of Nahash from Rabbah, of the people of Ammon, Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodibar, and Barzillai, the Giladite from Rogilam, brought beds and basins, earthen vessels and wheat, barley and flour, parched grain and beans, lentils and parched seeds, honey and curd, sheep and cheese of the herd, for David and for the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in The wilderness. Now, David, as he's fleeing from his son Absalom in this vast army, comes to this place here that is called Mahaniam. That literally means army encampment or encampment of angels. Literally means a place where a band of angels is camped, and the angels that came to help David in this time of crisis, they were really an interesting bunch of people. First, there's this guy named Shobi. He's the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the people of Ammon. Shobi would have been appointed governor over Ammon by David. He was a younger brother of the royal family from the Ammonite kingdom. And his older brother, Hunan, actually started a war with Israel. When when Shobi and Hunan's father died, David said, you know what? The man was kind to me, and I want to show him kindness the way he was kind to me. So David sends ambassadors, you know, to the Ammonite family, to the royal family, to, to express their condolences for the loss of their father. And Hunan, who's actually, you know, ruling now in his father's stead, Shobi's older brother, thinks the whole thing is a trick. And he treats David's servants, his envoy that comes, treats them disgracefully 
and abuses them and then starts a war and actually gets several other nations to, to join forces with him and fight against Israel. And uh, when it talks about from Rabbah, that's just the, the Ammonite capital. Now the Ammonites had been bitter enemies of Israel. And when David's own flesh and blood is persecuting him now, he finds a friend in Shobi from the royal family of Ammon. It's absolutely astonishing if you think about it. It seems like he would have thought, hey, David conquered our people. Now he's getting some of what he deserves. No, Shobi is an ally to David. The second guy in this band of angels that came to help David was this guy named Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodibar, another really interesting person to become an ally. He's the one that took in Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul, Israel's first king. Now, nobody else knew it, but David and Saul's son, Jonathan, had entered into this covenant with one another, and they promised to love one another and take care of one another's offspring. But, you know, Saul's household basically hated David. They thought David was a usurper. Jonathan is killed, and David thinks the family line is, is done. He, you know, assumes the throne, and in the meantime, he doesn't know this, but as he's coming into Jerusalem, into the capital, all that the rest of Saul's family is fleeing. They think David is going to kill them. David the usurper hates them. David is going to smash them to powder. And so turns out Saul has this one grandson, a little bitty old kid named Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, and his nursemaid grabs him, and as she's running out, they're trying to escape. She drops the boy, and he's so severely injured, he becomes permanently handicapped. The scripture says he became lame on his feet. And they flee out to Lodibar, and they hide out there. And this guy named Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodibar, becomes their protector. And then one day, some chariots arrive in Lodibar. And some of David's servants start asking, is there someone named Mephibosheth here? And when Maker hears it, he thinks, all right, it's, it's over for Mephibosheth. They find him. They take him back to the capital. But instead of executing him, David says, Mephibosheth, you're going to sit at my table like one of my own sons. You're family now. And he gave him back all of the estates of his grandfather Saul, treated him like his own son, treated him like royalty, and promised to take care of him for the rest of his life. And Maker had to be thinking, this is not what I expected at all. Maybe all of this stuff that I heard about David is not true after all. And there's a shift in his thinking about David. Respect and admiration begins to grow, and he becomes an ally, one of David's angels. And you know, it might just be there's someone in your own life that you've sort of written off, that you think they're an enemy, it's not always so wise to do that, my friend, because everything we think about people is not true. Anyway, we, we come to a third person in this encampment of angels. His name is Barzillai. It literally means iron heart or man of iron. Barzillai is 80 years old. And he comes to help David. Now, I got a question. What if Absalom wins? Why risk it all? I mean, it looks like, you know, it's done for David. This enormous army has come with Absalom. It looks like David doesn't stand a chance. And you think, you know, Barzillai, what are you doing? Why don't you just enjoy your twilight years? Why would you throw everything away, you know, at this juncture in your journey? You're risking your children's inheritance. Everything that you've done, everything you've earned for your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, it's liable to all vaporize. Now, this guy was a man of iron, and he became an unlikely angel in David's time of distress. And I want to talk to you for a little while about Iron Heart tonight, Barzillai. 
this unlikely ally that came to David in his time of need. Now, as the story progresses, Absalom and the army, they're defeated, and David is able to come back to Jerusalem, and we come to 2 Samuel chapter 19, and verse 31. It says, And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogelim and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old, and he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed in Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, Come across with me, and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. Now that's a pretty great, great offer there. Come to Jerusalem, sit at my table, enjoy the bounty of the palace. But listen how he responds, and there's some amazing things in what Barzillai says. Verse 34, But Barzillai said to the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king. And why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again, that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant Kimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Kimham shall cross over with me and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now, whatever you request of me, I'll do it for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. And we read in verse 32 that Barzillai was a very wealthy man. Literally in the Hebrew, it says he was a very great man. And much more than wealth is implied through the Hebrew word that is used. He was great in insight. He was great in wisdom. He was great in faith. He was great in generosity. He was great in humility. He was great in loyalty. And yes, he was also great in material resources. I just want to share with you some things that stand out to me from this short story that we've just read. In fact, six things that stand out about Barzillai that make him a giant of a man in the scriptures. Number one, he had a large estate, but he also had the largeness of heart to go with it. Largeness of heart. He realized that God had blessed him, but the purpose of being blessed was to be a blessing. To have wealth and not the heart to go with it is a curse. The Bible talks about the deceitfulness of riches. Barzillai was a very wealthy man. He had a great estate, but he had a great heart. And how blessed when there are men and women in a kingdom that have great resources, but also they have great hearts to go with it. It's more rare than you think, my friend. But Barzillai had, he had largeness of heart. Secondly, he was bold in faith. He was willing to take a risk for something worthy. Now, if Absalom remains in charge, like everything all the indicators say, he's taking a huge risk. Things will not go well for him. Things will not go well for his family if Absalom wins this conflict, either Barzillai is a fool or he's trusting God. He's either a fool or he has big faith. You know, like Moses, the scripture says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he had his eye on an eternal reward. And so did Barzillai, my friend. He was great in faith. Number three, Barzillai was compassionate 
not just sympathetic. There's a big difference between compassion and sympathy. Sympathy's good. I feel sorry for you. I, 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 my, my heart goes out. Maybe I can even relate. I've got empathy. I can see myself in, in your shoes. That, that, that's an important thing. But compassion is far beyond that, my friend. Compassion always is expressed through action. You read in the scriptures time and time again, Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. He was moved with compassion and he taught the people. Compassion always causes us to do something after we feel something. David and his men are weary, they're hungry, and they're discouraged. Barzillai recognized that and he acted. That is compassion. Barzillai was compassionate. He was filled with that compassion and it drove him to do something. Many, many people find it easy to sympathize. And I think sometimes when we genuinely feel sympathy for a situation or with people that are suffering, we feel good about ourselves. But I think we need to ask ourselves, Lord, should this grow beyond sympathy into compassion? Because sympathy alone changes nothing. But compassion can change things. Sometimes even the smallest act of compassion can change big things. And then the fourth thing I see about Barzillai is that he was aware of his own mortality. And he actually spoke of it quite frankly. And you know, this was a, it was a great impetus regarding Barzillai's generosity. He realized he was not long for this earth and he wasn't taking anything with him at all. And my friend, guess what? Neither are you, neither am I. I read the story about W.A. Criswell, the, BAP, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas years ago. He was on a plane ride, found himself sitting next to a, a noted theologian, you know, a, a Bible school professor, and he, Criswell just really wanted to have a conversation with this guy. He was really respected, you know, in, in the you know, Christian world for his knowledge of the Scripture. And after a little while, they did strike up a conversation. But Criswell found out the man had just lost his son. And he began to tell Pastor Criswell about the death of his little boy. He said, you know, he came home from school and he had a fever. And we thought it was just one of those childhood things. But it turned out to be a very virulent form of meningitis. We took him to the doctor, and the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. Your son is going to die. And that Bible school professor said, Pastor, I began the death vigil at my son's bedside. As he lay in bed, he said, it was the middle of the day. The sun was out, and my little boy's mind, I could tell, was becoming foggy and his vision was not good. And he says, Daddy, it's getting dark out, isn't it? He said, yeah, son, it's, it's getting very dark. He said, Daddy, I guess it's time for me to go to sleep, isn't it? He said, yeah, son, it's time for you to go to sleep. And he said his little boy had a special way of fixing his pillow and then putting his hands down and laying his head on his hands. And he did that. He fixed his little pillow and put his head on his hands, and he said, Good night, Daddy. I'll see you in the morning. He closed his eyes in death and stepped over into heaven. And then that theologian turned toward the window of the plane and just looked out the window, and he didn't say anything for a long, long time. Finally, he turns around and looks at Pastor Criswell with stinging tears rolling down his cheeks. He says, Pastor... I can hardly wait till the morning comes. Do you know, the truth is, morning is coming for every one of us. You're not here forever, friend. I'm not here forever. I buried another friend just a couple of days ago. Someone I knew very well, someone I respected very well that was not very old. Life is very fragile. It goes by very, very 
quickly. Evangelist D.L. Moody, his dying words were, Earth is receding, heaven is approaching, this is my crowning day. Like Barzillai, my friend, we need to think about our own mortality and live accordingly. Uh, the fifth thing I see about this great man is that he was humble. He referred to himself as a burden. Don't let me be a further burden to the king. And he said, you know, when David says, look, come to the palace with me, stay with me. He said, why should you repay me with such a reward? This guy, though, he was a great man, a respected man, a wealthy man, an influential man. He was little in his own eyes. And I think that made him great. And I just, I love this quality about Barzillai. Don't let me be a further burden to the king. Why would you reward me like that? Stay little in your own eyes. And the sixth thing, he was generationally minded. Though he personally and humbly refused David's offer, he did secure a blessing for his son, Kim Ham. His attitude of heart and his generosity translated into a future blessing for his offspring that they could have never acquired on their own. God is looking for people that are generational-minded that are willing to do something for the next generation. My friend, that is greatness in God's eyes. You know, the scripture tells us in 1 Kings chapter 2 that David, as he lay on his deathbed, he tells his son Solomon, show kindness to the sons of Barzillai and let them be among those who eat at your table because he came to me when I fled from Absalom. This guy secured a blessing for his children. In fact, there, there's a, an obscure scripture, but it's really quite telling. Jeremiah 41 and verse 17, it says, And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Kimham, which is near Bethlehem, as they went on their way to Egypt. This is generations and generations later. It's a piece of land that David gave to the son of Barzillai from his own personal family estate. Remember, David's family home and lands were in Bethlehem. That's not where Kimham was from. That's not where Barzillai was from. But here, this verse in Jeremiah talks about the habitation of Kimham. Now, Kim Ham, he didn't just get a nice estate. He was giving some, given something that was very near to David's heart and very personal to David. And it became a blessing that was passed on generationally from children to children to children. My friend, that's something that God wants. And I believe that as we express largeness of heart like Barzillai, this man of iron, this, this iron heart through compassion, through loyalty, through boldness, through generosity, through keeping our mortality in mind, that we're actually preparing a legacy in God for our children and for our children's children. Friend, I hope you got something out of the word today. And I tell you, I love Barzillai. He's an absolute legend. You don't hear a lot about him, but you know what? He did something that impacted his life, impacted the lives of those around him, and actually pulled other generations into that same flow of blessing that he had in his life. And you know, God wants you to be blessed as well. I would love to pray for you right now. In fact, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, maybe stop and just take a moment and let your heart go up to God with me while we pray together. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, my friend and I. We trust you, Lord, to, to 
intervene in their circumstance. I pray right now that they would receive strength from the Holy Spirit. I pray that they would receive guidance and Lord, that you'd show them the pathway that they need to walk during this particular season of their life. I pray a blessing over their family. I pray a blessing over their finances. Lord, I ask you to touch them and guide them in the mighty name of Jesus. God, thank you so much for joining me. And listen, if you've been a partner with us, I wanna say a special thank you because this broadcast and broadcasts like it that are taking the life of God's word and this, this living savior that we love and serve, taking the knowledge of him to the four corners of the world and by being a partner, you help make that possible. So a great, great blessing upon you. Heb je vragen over de uitzending? Of houd je iets bezig waarvoor we kunnen bidden? Schrijf ons dan. Of bel ons op. Ons team is er voor je. We have a daily email devotional that I believe can be of great benefit to you. You know, when we take God's Word in every day, it helps us become established in the Lord. The Bible talks about the inward man being renewed day by day. Jesus said to take up our cross daily and to follow Him. Lees de overdenking op je smartphone, s ochtends bij de koffie, wanneer je onderweg bent, of meteen op je computer. Take time to sow the seeds of God's Word into your life every day with this free email devotional. You know, we always go through different things in life. We always have besetting circumstances. The storms of life come to everyone. But in the midst of those storms, there is hope. God always has an answer for us. He always has a pathway for us to walk. And I have a special gift that we want to get into your hands called There Is Always Hope. It's a bundle of, of messages that will be a blessing to you. In whatever circumstance you're going through, they will bring you Hope. I hope that you get it. God wil jou hoop geven. Heel veel hoop. Of aan een dierbare van je. De verzameling omvat twee hoopvolle overdenkingen. Met een boekje over hoe God het leven van Belus veranderde. En bevrijde van verslaving en chaos. Bestel vandaag een exemplaar. De contactgegevens staan nu in beeld. Hou moed. Er is altijd hoop.